Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rev Left Radio. On today's episode, I have back on the show philosopher Matt Siegel to talk about his newest work, which is really a publication of his dissertation. He got his PhD in philosophy uh, with this work called Crossing the Threshold, a Theoric Imagination in the Post-Kantian Process Philosophy of Schelling and Whitehead. And I certainly know that people who are not into philosophy or not trained in philosophy might think that title sounds challenging, uh, above and beyond what they're capable of comprehending. But I promise you, if you struggle and challenge yourself to kind of learn, we lay out some of the basic philosophical concepts we're working with, and then this picture emerges of the way that Matt thinks, the way he's engaging with philosophy, and it is dialectical to its core. It is all about the things I talk about here on the show, whether I'm talking about Buddhism or dialectical materialism or doing our dialectics deep dive series. It is constantly re sort of addressing and coming back to this dialectical way of apprehending the cosmos, apprehending our place in it, apprehending our deep connections with the earth and nature as expressions of the earth and nature. Um, this, you know, overcoming this delusion of separateness that we feel. And Matt is doing that work as well at the high levels of philosophy. And so I, I really appreciate his work and the vision that emerges from it, which we talk about at length in this episode, is absolutely in line with the vision that emerges, hopefully, from Rev Left Radio as a whole and all the work I do, which I can, I can think of and, and conceptualize as absolutely pointing in the same exact direction that you know somebody like Matt is pointing in and so many other thinkers, whether in philosophy or outside of it, have pointed in from Marx to the Buddha to you know Alfred North Whitehead, which we talk about in this episode, and many, many other figures. So this is really powerful, important, moving stuff, and um, I just can't say enough kind words about Matt and his work. So I'll leave it at there for now. And as always, if you like what we do here at Rev Left Radio, you can join our Patreon for pretty much the, the cost of a single cup of coffee every month. You can support the show, keep us going, and get access to three to four bonus episodes every single month that patrons get access to. And I do a lot of other stuff on the Patreon that I don't necessarily do on the public feed, including covering like timely headlines responding to anti-socialist or anti-left-wing arguments by popular right-wing or centrist figures and just kind of, you know, let my hair down a little bit on the Patreon in ways that I don't always do on the public episode for obvious reasons. So if you're interested at that, you want to support the show, um, you can go to patreon.com forward slash revleftradio, sign up for $5 a month and get three to four bonus episodes every single month. Um, And we deeply, deeply appreciate it. It's what keeps this show going on. So thank you to everybody who supports the show. Thank you to everybody listening. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Matt Segal on his new book, Crossing the Threshold. Enjoy. So I'm Matt Segal. I am a teacher and researcher, uh, transdisciplinary researcher, I like to say, applying process philosophy to the natural and social sciences, as well as the study of consciousness. And I'm very glad to be back on Rev Left. Yeah, happy to have you back. It's an honor and a pleasure every time we get a talk. Um, I know like it's only been like a year or so since we had our first episode and already we're on episode number three, but that's a testament to the interesting work you do and my interest in it and the uh, audience's interest in, in you and in your work and having you on the show. So I'm, I'm happy to have you back. Yeah, well, glad to see. Glad to hear there's been uh, some receptivity from from the audience, and uh, hopefully we can continue that today. Totally, yeah. And for those that don't know, um, we've we've had you on to talk about the work of Whitehead, which we'll be you know revisiting today. Um, we also had you on our German idealism episode, which again, Schelling is one of the figures of German idealism, which we'll be touching on again today. Um, so if people listen to this episode and like it, there are two more with you that they can go check out and have deeper dives on you know, two main uh, philosophers that you wrestle with and and work with in this text. But this text is a standalone book in and of itself, and the new book is titled Crossing the Threshold, A Theoric Imagination in the Post-Kantian Process Philosophy of Schelling and Whitehead. So as a way to sort of orient our audience uh, to this book and what we'll be talking about today, can you just kind of talk about why you wrote the book, what you wanted to explore with it, and what exactly is the threshold that is being crossed? Yeah, happy to. Um, so this was actually my uh, dissertation 
for my PhD in philosophy. Um, and I've thoroughly revised it and, uh, it's taken G six or seven years to finally publish it as a book. But, um, what I'm trying to accomplish in this book is to, um, approach the transcendental idealism of Immanuel Kant, uh, as a sort of, um, necessary, uh, fa uh, phase of maturation that, um, uh, that the human being in its pursuit, not only of scientific knowledge of nature, but of moral freedom um, that, that we need to pass through, but that we can't stop there. Um, I try to pay respect to, to Kant's methodology and um, to, you know, explicate the, the reasons that he tried to, as I, I think we'll get into as we move forward here, he tried to limit human knowledge in order to leave room for freedom, which is, basically a paraphrase of what he says in the preface uh, to the critique of pure reason. And I try to draw on um, Alfred North Whitehead and uh, Friedrich Schelling to cross the threshold, as I put it, beyond the limits of knowledge uh, that Kant erected in his transcendental approach to philosophy. Um, one way of thinking about what that threshold is, is to think about um, sense experience, uh, sensory experience as Kant understood it. And, uh, you know, drawing on Whitehead and showing, I try to uh, suggest that um, the construal of our um, sensory experience offered by Kant, and not just Kant, but other modern philosophers that uh, he was in dialogue with, uh, particularly David Hume, that this construal of our sensory experience is... Uh, probably incomplete and in need of um, some amendments. And as amended, uh, I think we can um, rearticulate uh, an epistemology or a way of knowing that would not be limited by um, our sense perception of spatially arrayed surfaces, as it were. And we'll get into more uh, detail about, about what exactly is entailed by that sort of definition. But both Whitehead and Schelling reject the idea that um, our most uh, primordial or basic form of experience uh, is just sense experience in this way that I've just defined. They think that uh, we actually uh, have a form of experience, which Whitehead calls um, bodily reception as opposed to sense perception. Uh, he also refers to it as um, perception in the mode of causal efficacy. So what that means in layman's terms is that um, our perception through our our bodies is rooted in these um, causal vectors, which don't really respect the skin boundary, um, that there are, uh, in Whitehead's terms, feeling vectors uh, that are sort of um, vibrating into us from the environment and vibrating back out of us. Uh, to alter that environment. And so um, crossing the threshold means coming to recognize this deeper form of perception that puts us back in touch with the natural world around us in a way that um, Kant did not think was possible. So, How's that? Yeah, this deeper form of uh, perception would sort of take for granted that we are embedded and a part of nature as a par as opposed to something put inside of it, trying to analyze it or trying to find an objective viewpoint um, to stand outside of it. Is that kind of a fair way to think about that? Exactly. Yeah, that's very well put. Okay, cool. And I know this is, um, you know, for people in the audience that aren't trained in philosophy, and even those that are, I mean, Immanuel Kant can certainly um, be difficult to wrestle with. Uh, you know, his critique of pure reason, I remember reading it as a grad student, and um and and having a really tough time with it. So I guess the, and, and since it's an important part of your book, in a lot of ways, the starting point of your book, um, I kind of want to maybe lay some of Kant's basic philosophy on the table. So can you discuss the parts of of Immanuel Kant's philosophy that that you're taking up in this work and kind of help our audience to orient themselves to the basic philosophical terrain that that you're treading here? Yeah, so um, Kant is a, a crucial uh, philosopher, um, and you know what he does with his uh, his late work. Uh, really, it was towards the end of his life that he wrote his three critiques: uh, the first of critique of pure reason, and then a critique of practical reason, and finally a critique of judgment. And what he's doing here is um, 
kind of uh, reversing the relationship between the subjective knower and the objects known that he felt had been presupposed by all philosophy prior. So um, what Kant called dogmatic philosophy was was basically this view that um, the subject or the knower must conform to the objects that are out there, right? And knowledge consists in such a confirmation of uh, the subject in some way or other mirroring the objects that are around it. Um, and thereby coming to know them. And what Kant does is reverse this and says, no, no, the objects must conform to the subject. Uh, in other words, um, the way that our mind is organized um, and our senses are organized uh, shapes a priori, he would say, which means shapes before experience um, the objects that are possible for us to know. So objectivity in Kant's inverted view, as it were, uh, becomes um, something that subjects construct. The subject constructs, or he would say determines, the objects that it comes to know by applying its own uh, pre-installed categories, as it were, um, and uh, by um, shaping those objects through its uh, forms of intuition, is Kant's phrase, which um, he says we have two forms of intuition, spatial and temporal intuition, and spatial in intuition is uh, our outer sense, um, and uh, temporal intuition would be our inner sense. And it's in Kant's treatment of space and time, right, as our outer and inner um, intuitions of the world around us, that he says we don't, you know, we don't learn about space and time empirically as if uh, by coming into contact with a bunch of uh, extended objects in space uh, that endure through time that we gradually just kind of come to abstract these ideas of space and time. He says, no, that they're, they're pre-installed, right? Which is to say they're transcendental. They're not empirical. Um, transcendental here is another way of uh, referring to what, um, how our experience is structured prior to any particular experience that we have, right? So it's not Space and time for Khan are not something we learn about through experience. There's something that we bring to experience uh, that we always already are shaping our experience through. And it's Kant's treatment of space and time that I really try to dive into in this book um, to expand some of the insights that Kant uh, is, is able to articulate in his um, sort of phenomenological inquiry into space and time. And the problem is that in the critique of pure reason, um, Kant has this relatively short section in a very long book. It's like 20 pages, which he calls uh, the transcendental aesthetic, which is where he looks at our experience of space and time, or rather the way that space and time structure our experience, to put it uh, more precisely. And Whitehead says in Process and Reality that Kant really should have um, spent most of the book, the critique of pure reason, um, on this particular issue, right? Our intuitions of space and time, because it, it seems to me, and, and, you know, I'm following in the footsteps of, of geniuses like Whitehead and, and Schelling here. Um, it seems to me that, uh, in our spatial and temporal intuition, there's, um, something far more, uh, what cosmic going on, um, than what, when, than what Kant believed, uh, for Kant, Right, space and time are something provided by the subject. And what I want to do in this book is say, no, space and time are something uh, achieved by um, a community of subjects, right? And so one way of understanding how Whitehead um, takes up Kant's philosophy and, and expands it and in some ways cosmologizes it is what Kant thought was only true of human subjects uh, Whitehead says is uh, true of subjects in a much more general sense. So, you know, uh, people who have listened to our prior conversations might recall um, that Whitehead is a pan experientialist, uh, which is to say he thinks that experience in some form, um, to some degree, goes all the way down, right? And to exist is to experience. So, whether we're talking about electromagnetic radiation, or uh, stars and galaxies, or single cells, plants, animals, and human beings. There's some form of experience 
um, that is just part of what it means uh, to exist as an entity. And so what Whitehead basically says is um, subjects of various sorts um, with different forms of experience are uh, cooperating with one another uh, and uh, relating with one another so as to bring forth what uh, physicists know and you know can uh, measure in various ways as space and time. Um, and that what we experience just in our everyday um, you know, attempt to navigate the world as space and time is similarly this achievement by a whole cosmic community uh, of of subjectivities, right? And so it's breaking us out of what I think is ultimately a, a solipsistic or kind of um, ego-enclosed uh, perspective that Kant leaves us with, uh, breaking out of that to to uh, step into a more cosmocentric uh, orientation, right? To put the human being, as you were saying, back uh, in touch seamlessly with with the natural world out of which we come. Mm. Yeah, incredibly fascinating stuff. Um, to, to talk about Kantian's sort of um, idealism, if you will, or you know, Kant's idea that what the, the human subject brings to the natural world, like when we look out at the natural world or any any object outside of ourselves, is that, you know, Kant is saying, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, that there's like, we, we, we come fully equipped with a sort of cognitive apparatus or, a, you know, layers of lenses that we cannot remove that are, that are, you know, essential to our basic functioning that shape the objective world or shape how we, um, interpret and understand the outside world, these sort of pre-installed categories that we have. So when we look out at the world, you know, um, we, we sort of, without even knowing it, impose a certain interpretation onto the world as it actually is, which is why he says things like you can't know things in, in and of themselves, right? You can only know your sort of interpretation of them. And, and that kind of culminates into this idea of transcendental idealism, I believe. Even I'm a little shaky mm -hmm. on some of this. So um, can you correct anything I said wrong there or, and kind of maybe help us flesh out again what transcendental idealism means in this context? Yeah, no, I think you've you've articulated that very well. Um, and yes, so what, what Kant does with his transcendental idealism is um, reimagine what natural science is, uh, natural scientists tend to be, um, Kant would say, kind of naive realists, and they think that they're discovering things about a mind-independent world, uh, laws of physics and so on. And um, Kant's point is that, and his you know, prime exemplar for this was, was Isaac Newton, that when Newton is um, articulating using mathematics, uh, his laws of, of motion and universal gravitation and so on, uh, he's not actually um, discovering something that exists out there and kind of just describing it. Rather, uh, he's it, w using mathematical reasoning. Uh, he's actually uncovering the structure of his own mind. Uh, and so the natural scientist in Kant's view um, is trying to find application for uh, certain categories of understanding. Right. And yeah, scientists use experiment and observation and so on. But in a kind of um, almost uh, quasi Platonist way, like Plato would talk about knowledge as um, remembrance or recollection of something that we already knew that the soul already had sort of implanted in it eternally. Kant's suggesting something not too far from that, that uh, when we engage in um, natural scientific study, we're really trying to. Uh, remember and uncover these um, not laws of nature so much as laws of our own understanding, right? And what what nature becomes in Kant's view is a highly structured um, appearance, right? And so you could caricature Kant and say, oh, he's reducing knowledge to just mere appearance and that, that there's no necessity and universality to it. He's like, no, actually, because our mind has these universal and necessary categories, right, that are um, shaped by mathematics and logic, like they're really, this is secure, um, uh, like, uh, knowledge, like, and, and there are logical principles at play here that are not just um, merely apparent, right? This is what's structuring our knowledge of the appearances of nature. And so Kant would say, despite the fact that this is all in one way or another subjective, 
um, science can still claim universal and necessary uh, knowledge of, of the apparent world uh, because, you know, we're using math uh, to describe it. Now, this, of course, as you mentioned, leaves us with a kind of um, dualism, if, if not a dualism of two different kinds of, of stuff as we had, like in Descartes, right? Mental stuff and material or extended stuff. That's kind of an ontological dualism. Two different kinds of being uh, that exist in the world is, is what Descartes leaves us with. And Kant doesn't leave us with that kind of dualism. It's more of uh, an epistemological dualism, uh, a dualism in um, how we understand knowledge and what it's what we're capable of knowing. So Kant said that all knowledge is really uh, merely phenomenal, meaning it has to do with phenomena or appearances. And there's this um, limit to our knowledge, the other side of which is, you could say, noumenal would be his word, but he also talks about uh, the realm of things in themselves, right? And what what, what can we say about those things in themselves? Um, not much. <laughs> Kant wanted to posit that there is something out there, um, but you, we can't say anything about it because the categories of our understanding really only de determine the phenomenal world. So we're left in this dualistic situation, right? And one way, again, of talking about the threshold I'm trying to cross uh, in, in the course of this book uh, is this phenomenal noumenal threshold. I'm trying to um, reconfigure our experiential situation so that that boundary uh, does not arise. Mm. Yeah, really interesting. Um, and yeah, so there's so much to say there. I guess just for like people listening, uh, especially, I think we've even done this in our last episode when Marxists hear phrases like idealism and materialism, it's kind of worth just kind of pointing that out. The idealism of transcendental idealism within Kant's philosophy is this idea that the subjective cognitive apparatus we bring to the objective world structures how we understand the objective world. And in some sense, we can't strip away that scaffolding, that cognitive scaffolding that we're born with and see the cosmos in and of itself as it truly is beyond any human interpretation of it. And so that's that, um, that's the idealism, right? Is that there's, there's something inherent in subjectivity that structures the way we understand the objective world. And thus the mind plays a crucial role in our understanding of external phenomena. Correct. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And, and just to clarify quickly, like, um, there's so much that's true in that, right? And you can you can see the various ways that Kant's philosophy has been carried forward um, in the contemporary world. I mean, so much of um, cognitive neuroscience and uh, psychology takes this this sort of point of view, even if they're not as strict about um, the underlying philosophical principles. The idea that the mind plays a constructive role um, in our perception of the world is, um, you know impossible to just dismiss right and so um but what i what i'm trying to do is uh as whitehead would put it transcend and and include what what kant is suggesting and so um what i call descendental realism or um descendental philosophy is not the antithesis of uh transcendental idealism um it's i would hope more of a a synthesis um, that's allowing us to restore, you know, a kind of what you might call a naive realism that preceded Kant, uh, to if that's the thesis, and Kant's critical idealism or transcendental idealism is uh, the antithesis, then uh, descendental philosophy, I hope, is a kind of synthesis, mm. um, a more mature realism, as it were. Yeah, interesting, and we'll we'll get to that a little bit later because I want you to kind of sort of retread that specific idea and the, and the concepts surrounding it in a bit here. But um, you you state, quote, the pages that follow do not lay out a linear argument attempting to prove the existence of a world soul or the possibility of supersensory knowledge. Rather, they invite the reader into a series of self amplifying metaphysical experiments seeking to produce intensified experience in the etheric intuition, end quote. Can you kind of discuss uh, what this means specifically regarding the idea of experiments seeking to produce an experience in the reader? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to head off at the pass, uh, as it were, early in the book. Um, you know, the, 
the expectations that especially analytic philosophers might have about uh, how a philosophical text is uh, supposed to um, engage the reader as a kind of, you know, logical argument, right? And, you know, you so you set out your premises and then um, try to de- deduce uh, the consequences. But often, um, you know, philosophers will just have to end up saying that their premises are um, self-evident or what have you. And um, they spend the bulk of their time on the deductions and Whitehead's method of philosophy. And I'm, I'm a Whiteheadian, right? Like I, I, I don't think he's right about everything, but I, I think um, in terms of uh, the best we can do integrating the history of philosophy and all of contemporary science and human aspirations, um, whether, you know, we think of those as, as spiritual aspirations or political aspirations, uh, social aspirations, I think Whitehead is just, you know, for me, um, um, gets me the furthest in these inquiries. And so um, his method is, is of philosophizing is not um, narrowly analytic, right? He's not trying to prove anything. He's rather um, trying to assemble a scheme of, of ideas. And what he means by ideas is not something abstract, but um, a kind of uh, lens that we can wear to see the world differently, right? And so when he is um, engaging in philosophical assemblage, he's offering us different metaphysical equipment. Um, you know, scientists use telescopes and microscopes and particle colliders and so on as their experimental equipment. Um, the metaphysician uses language. Um, language is the instrument that we're experimenting on here. And uh, language isn't just, um, you know, abstract uh, co- collections of definitions and so on. Language is, is, a, is a poetic activity, right? It's, it's something um, that's very much um, intimately interwoven with our perception of the world. That, you know, when we, we can see by studying different cultures, um, the words they have for different colors, for example, um, or um, different uh, aspects of their local environments. Um, you know, like uh, it's often said Eskimos have like a hundred words for snow. I don't know if it's quite that many, but you get the idea that um, language is, uh, you know, part of human behavior, obviously, but it's like, it's, it's, it's intimately interwoven with, um, our neurophysiology, if you want to think about it um, in in material terms, but also with with the very structure of our consciousness, right? And so by metaphysical experiments that intensify experience, I'm talking about, you know, different ways of poetically rendering into language um, our encounter with reality, whether it's the inner reality of our um, psychological um, soul life or or the outer reality of, um, of, of the surrounding cosmos, um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, experiment with different ways of talking about um, what, uh, what this existence is, is really like. And so it's you know, an invitation um, into a novel way of speaking. And so I, I don't want people to think um, that I will, at the end of this book, have proven um a particular ism or whatever but rather uh i I hope that i will have painted a picture that people appreciate enough to consider um not just as as a possibility but as something to try to actualize yeah beautiful um is is there anything just out of curiosity because i know how philosophy departments sort of sort of operate in their heavy analytic bias is there anything to be said about the analytic continental uh, divide here as far as your approach? And, and is there any weirdness in its reception given that it's sort of flying in the face of more, um, I guess, mainstream analytic philosophy texts and how analytic philosophers go about doing philosophy? Well, I mean, I don't want to disparage uh, an entire school of thought, right? I think there's so much of value in analytic philosophy. And in so many ways, um, Whitehead is one of the inaugurators of that method um you know he and bertrand russell uh who was began as his student and became his collaborator on the principia mathematica 
kind of developed the the idea that we can think with a symbolic logic um, and that this is really the the um, the ideal for clear and and uh, accurate thinking is is to is to use um, analytic methods like this and Whitehead took logic very seriously uh, logical analysis but he didn't think that it was um, the proper method for philosophizing um, because language um, while it can do really creative and imaginative things to alter our perception as I was saying when we limit it to symbolic uh, logic we run the risk of um, falling prey to what he called the fallacy of the perfect dictionary um, which is to say that we already have all the ideas and concepts we need to understand the world and so it's just a matter of lining up those concepts correctly and Whitehead thinks that um, you know language is always uh, intimately interrelated with experience but that there's something about experience which is um, open-ended and creatively advancing in such a way that we're never going to be finished with the dictionary. Um, we need to invent new words and, and new phrasings. Um, and, and remember that no verbal statement, no even logical or mathematical proposition can ever finally render the world uh, in its complete form, simply because the world itself is incomplete uh, in Whitehead's view, right, as a process philosopher. And, and in Schelling's view, there's a kind of incompleteness uh, that is intrinsic to, to nature uh, because nature is a creative advance. And so, you know, analytic philosophy is important, um, but I think we need to go further. Continental philosophy in that it is typically phenomenological, you know, it's trying to look at human experience. I think it, it, uh, it also can't be ignored. Um, it adds something to the merely analytic approach that would otherwise kind of get forgotten and erased um which is human experience and uh history and um the role of interpretation and, and hermeneutics and all these things that um are kind of just I don't know, backgrounded or ignored by the analytic approach uh but then uh, the problem at least more historically with continental philosophy this has changed um in light of what's called the ontological turn or the non-human turn um, but, you know, phenomenology historically was, was pretty anthropocentric, um, right? The focus was human experience. And because initially most of these were European dudes, it was human experience was, was mostly construed in, in more of a, um, white male kind of a way. Um, but, you know, nowadays this has definitely, um, been, um, an issue that's been, and continues to be um, dealt with in productive ways so that its phenomenology can be less anthropocentric and um, less Eurocentric. And that's a very positive development, but um, I think there are ways in which the um, process relational perspective on all these things that, you know, it's one way of talking about Whitehead's philosophy um, it's it's able to draw on analytic and continental uh, approaches while also um, going further in in some some crucial ways. Um, and you know, a lot of the changes that have occurred in more recent continental philosophy and phenomenology, um, you know, to break out of anthropocentrism, are um, a consequence of encountering Whitehead's philosophy. Right, so he's played a role in these positive developments. Um, but yeah, I think uh, ultimately I, I would want to, us to overcome this analytic continental divide and um, a process relational approach is a good way to to do that. Again, to seek a kind of synthesis between the two. Yeah, really, really interesting. Thank you for that. So as I've said earlier, we've we've had you on previous episodes to talk at length about Whitehead and Schelling, but let's revisit the relevant aspects of their philosophies for this work, starting uh, mm -hmm. with Schelling. So how was Schelling an organic process philosopher, and what aspects of his philosophy do you take up, interpret, and work with in this book in particular? Yeah, so um, Schelling's often thought of as an idealist, and there's good reason for that, but he also developed a philosophy of nature um, in the late 1700s in the wake of, of Kant's um, revolution in philosophy, really. Uh, so, I mean, the first 
major German philosopher to inherit um, Kant's the spirit of Kant's philosophy was was uh, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, and um, you know Fichte was the philosopher of the I, uh, the you know capital I first person pronoun the um, the the ego as um, as you know Kant would have it as as sort of freely creating its world um, rather than uh, passively um, receiving uh, a separately existing world. And Schelling studied Fichte's philosophy um, very closely through the um, mid 1790s and began to come into his own as a philosopher uh, by defending the Fichtean point of view, but. Schelling um, more and more came to realize that nature was being given short shrift in this whole approach. Um, to say that all of reality, all of the universe is um, the result of the constructive activity of the ego, um, to Schelling seemed somewhat one-sided. And it led him to a closer study of Spinoza, uh, for one thing, um, but also, you know, Schelling always had this um, mystical, uh, pietist, sort of the form of Christianity of Protestantism um, in his part of Germany at this time. He had this mystical sense of nature as a kind of um, incarnate divinity and as as a nature as a kind of dynamic process that, um, you know, the incarnation isn't something that just happens all at once. It's rather this dynamic evolutionary process that moves through a series of stages. And so always in the background for Schelling, even when he was um, much aligned with Fichte's approach as a young, uh, really he was in his late teens at this point when he started publishing um, works of of philosophy and journals, um, he he was always uh, trying to hold this perspective in balance um, to keep the ego and nature uh, more in balance with each other, but he didn't publicize this until uh, around 1797. His his first uh, he started lecturing on uh, on the philosophy of nature, and he publishes uh, a book called Ideas for Philosophy of Nature uh, in 1797. And you know, in this book, what he's basically doing is picking up on some of Kant's ideas about organisms and their um, in internal uh, purposiveness or uh, their um, form of, of teleology that Kant described, um, which is just teleology is the sort of study of ends or purposes, that organisms display a kind of purposive activity that's not found in the material, in the inorganic world, uh, where a different kind of sort of linear causality reigns. In organisms, Kant said, there's this circular causality where an organism in being composed of parts which produce one another for the sake of a whole, uh, that there's not just the mechanical or efficient causality one sees in the inorganic world, there's this formal causality and final causality, uh, which is to say there's this self-organizing end-directed activity in living organisms. So Schelling picks up on this idea and... um, really applies it to cosmology, applies it to metaphysics in ways that Kant was not comfortable with because, you know, Kant was still putting the subject at the center uh, of philosophy, um, right? Where uh, rather than, as I said earlier, saying that um, the subject must conform to the objects around it in order to know them, Kant had said that, uh, no, the objects must conform to the subject, to the structure of the subject's way of knowing them. Schelling, again, inverts this, right? So there's a kind of double inversion moving from dogmatic through Kantian to Schellingian philosophy, where instead of asking um, what must the mind be such that nature can appear to us in the way that it does, as Kant had asked, Schelling asks, what must nature be such that mind could have emerged from it, such that our consciousness capable of knowing it could have, could itself be uh, a higher potency of the very natural world that we're attempting to know. So um, Schelling allows us to remain um, critical and not dogmatic in the way that, you know, Kant was, was so focused on uh, establishing 
Um, but shelling allows us to break out of the Kantian shell, as it were, which would keep the, keep us locked within a realm of appearances, unable to touch the real world. Because shelling is saying that the natural world, far from being a mere appearance, is the source of our mind, uh, that nature has a soul. In other words, nature has an interior. And we know that because we are that interior. And recognizing that, um, it doesn't only have implications for how we do science. I mean, there's a deep kind of spirituality in that as well. Um, not necessarily a Spinoza's pantheism, sort of kind of compatible with that, but it's a slightly more complex um, point of view because, you know, in Spinoza, there's there's no room really for human freedom. Um, to say that we're the mind and nature are one thing in Spinoza is is to say that mind is determined by natural laws. Whereas in Schelling and in Whitehead, natural laws are um, more like habits. They're things that are established through social relations, whether through human social relations, where we make laws in democratic societies, hopefully, uh, or in you know relations between non-human entities uh, that that develop into these sort of um, statistical patterns um, or habits, right? And so the laws of physics in a Schellingian or what Hedian point of view would be uh, more like the, the social habits of electrons and protons that have been um, collectively established over billions of years of evolution, right? So I think Schelling adds this, the possibility of a kind of creative freedom. It's like, yes, the world is structured by these social habits, but they're also, um, these habits are habits because the world continues to evolve. And there's some creative impulse that in the natural world leads to unexpected emergence. Um, you know, photons and, and, and electrons and protons eventually, you know, become organized so as to bring forth elemental atoms um, and and then stars and galaxies and from a you know Schellingian point of view or Whiteheadian point of view even if there were, were scientists around um, at that early stage in cosmogenesis or the evolution of the universe uh, when it was just like protons and electrons and photons and stuff like the plasma stage they never even if they had a complete knowledge of the universe at that stage they never would have seen even like a helium atom, much less a star or a galaxy as being possible um, in the future, right? And so there's creative emergence that uh, allows us to describe a universe, not just as the kind of closed necessary order uh, that you have in Spinoza, but more as this open-ended adventure. Mm. And, and one implication of that is, of course, when we create as human beings, art, philosophy, science, religion, um, civilization, that we are uh, sort of a microcosmic version of the whole creative power intrinsic to the universe. And our creativity emerges out of, you know, the cosmos just as much as it emerges out of us, because as you said, we are the interiority of the cosmos. You know, other ways of putting that is we are the, the we are nature becoming conscious of itself. Or, you know, I've even put it in terms of like environmental activism against the degradation of of the natural world that we're currently living through is like the earth literally fighting for itself through us like we are the earth becoming conscious and that is a smaller version of the cosmos itself becoming conscious of course not just through human beings but through all conscious creatures all experiential creatures and i'm sure you know higher levels of alien intelligence that are out there as well are just as much the interiority of the cosmos experiencing itself from a seemingly infinite um, amount of point of views, um, right? So like this idea in Kant that there's a certain uh, unique causality within organism Schelling takes and applies to the cosmos itself. And one of those implications being that our consciousness is literally how, is, it, is a creative emergence of the entire cosmos and literally how the cosmos comes into a form of its own self-awareness and self-consciousness. Very well put. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I think you've got it. Um, you know, and, and it, 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 I think I, I really want to emphasize the extent to which, yeah, we are the universe become conscious of itself, which I mean, in some circles is almost a cliche at this point. And like, what does that, what does that really mean? Well, I love the way you connected that to, you know, these 
um, fights to protect uh, Gaia, to protect the community of life on Earth, um, because it, yeah, it has intrinsic value, but also because that's us. That's that's what we are. And what are we protecting it from? Well, there's this split that has occurred in in the human being, which I think you know whether we could point to Descartes or Kant as expressions of how this split plays out but um it's a split between a sense of our consciousness as continuous with the interiority of the rest of the cosmos and what you could call just this sort of disembedded alienated intellect which is the fictian ego it's the it's the kantian subject that thinks that it's cut off from the world by this screen of sense perception uh, that produces appearances, which we know according to our own sort of um, internal organization, that that sense of a alienated, disconnected intellect is what's driving techno-industrial, techno-capitalist civilization, right? And and the urgency of the kind of perspective I'm trying to articulate here is 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 I'm I'm really trying to talk to that intellect and say, hey, you're not actually disconnected from the world. Um, and I just want to get that alienated ego, uh, and, you know, maybe people know of Ian McGilchrist's work. I'm obviously talking about the left hemisphere, um, maniacal, uh, um, attempt to master the world that, that, that typifies that sort of left hemisphere way, way of thinking that is that Kantian ego, that Kantian intellect is obsessed with trying to master nature according to these deterministic rules that it's, uh, producing and i just want to get that ego to kind of like slow down and and look down to remember that it has a body and that it's only possible for it to do all of its thinking in the context of that body and that that body is inseparable from uh the ecosystems around it from the soil uh from the the the, the plants and animals that it has to uh, eat in order to survive i mean some would say it doesn't have to eat animals but uh, that nonetheless we are um, embedded in this whole community of life and I think it would actually be um, a tremendous relief if this ego would just look down and that's what descendental in a sense is is pointing to as as the method I'm articulating in this book I'm just I'm saying we need to look look down and in and recognize that uh, at the that in the depths of our own conscious egoic um, experience, there is this this portal to um, into this cosmic creativity. And so, you know, etheric imagination is in the title. It's what I'm trying to point to is this cosmic creativity that's at the depths of our own thinking activity, of our own imaginative uh, capacity. And I think thinking, feeling, willing, these different what used to be called faculties or powers of our um, cognition. Um, these are all different ways of talking about the imagination. And, um, I'm, I'm trying to yeah, speak to this, uh, Kantian intellect. Yeah. To get it to just remember, uh, what's, what's always been there at the edge of its experience, because that's the portal back into communion with the cosmos. So yeah, and what comes out of this is like, you know, this philosophy that we're doing, although it can seem sort of abstract and speculative and kind of hard to grapple with, has real life consequences in the real world and is really behind so much of the troubles that we're dealing with in society, whether it's the eco-crisis, whether it's war, nationalism, various forms of hate, fascism, etc. Um, and it's it's not a coincidence that... You know, science is kind of catching up to this with concepts like the flow state, but that we're at our most creative and we feel the most alive precisely when we are not incessantly referring back to ourself and thinking about ourselves, but when we lose ourselves, lose our uh, felt sense of a separate self up here somewhere in the head commenting on everything that's happening, we can actually, you know, uh, let ourselves fall into the thing that we're doing. And this is called the flow state. And there's all these, you know, cognitive scientists working on this and, and what it means and how to get into it, etc. But that creativity of the cosmos comes out most when our ego is the least active, uh, which is an interesting thing. And, and also, I just wanted to say that this delusion of separateness, 
um, that is fueling, you know, just crises after crises. I mean, it's behind everything from colonialism. Those people over there are subhuman. We can go take their land. Slavery, again, you know, they're not us. They're something outside of us. They're actually more objective outside nature than they are subjects like us white men in Europe are subjects, right? And so this delusion of separateness is at the root of, of so much. And in each one of us, it's a felt sense of separate. And we truly, if you can look at yourself and how you think about your own life, think about your own death and feel yourself to be moment to moment, you know, assuming you don't do extensive <laughs> spiritual practices like Buddhist meditation or experiment heavily with psychedelics or whatever, is if you're honest with yourself and you really pay attention, you you feel this too. You feel as if you know, my consciousness is inside my skull, fundamentally separate from everybody and everything else. I was placed into the universe, and one day I'll be ripped out of it. <laughs> and that is, a, you know, it's not often articulated. It operates often subconsciously in most people. But that is a felt sense of separateness that is what we're talking about here. And it can be overcome through, obviously, various methods. But, um, you know, if you can look inside and see that that sense of separateness is there, you can agree with us that that's fundamentally an illusion that's not backed up by science. Um, you can start working in the direction of, of seeing beyond that, that illusion and um, the interesting things that can happen and the, and the reimagining and the different relationship you have with your own existence when you can see through that ego delusion um, that you are somehow separate from everything and everyone else around you. Yeah, yeah, beautifully put. Um, and I, I think, you know, again, as I, as I said at the start, like this, there's something about the egotistical, um, perspective that in, is necessary to go through. Like w we need that, um, critical stance to like grow up out of, um, a childish point of view where it's like almost primitive narcissism. Right. Um, and so this isn't just a sort of like naive um, return to the womb oceanic feeling that psychoanalyt uh, psychoanalytic Freudian um, um, critiques would, would want to resist. This is, um, I, I really want to go through the Kantian point of view, right? And, and to acknowledge that um, in order to connect with the universe, we first have to uh, have experienced the possibility of separation. Yeah. Um, and only once we have uh, tasted alienation can we truly, freely, uh, through as an act of love, uh, remember our 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 connection uh, with 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 the cosmos and and with each other. So um, I think it's so important, like you know what we're saying that we have to reconnect, but it's. It's also important, you know, to to honor the um, that part of the struggle of of waking up and becoming conscious as as free and loving human beings is experiencing this possibility of of separation. Uh, we couldn't be free unless we experience that possibility. Yeah, I think that's incredibly important. There's a fundamental difference between the infant and the Buddha. <laughs> and that fundamental yes. difference is the only way out is through. It's not some regression to some past state. It is you have to develop this, you know, through the, the delusion of, of separateness, you have to develop this sort of what we would consider in a functioning society, a healthy ego, and then be able to transcend it um, to not develop that. And we've seen like, you know, the feral children, children that aren't raised in social contexts, that they don't come out as, as you know, Buddhas. <laughs> they're, they're deformed and they're, they're prevented from their full blossoming. So, yes, I really think that that's an incredibly important point to make. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move forward, um, and let's talk a little bit about Whitehead. Of course, we have an entire episode. People interested can go dive deeper into that. But just sort of what we did for Schelling to do for Whitehead here, um, how was he a process philosopher, maybe how he differs from Schelling, and just the aspects of his philosophy that you're really emphasizing um, in this work in particular. Yeah, so, you know, and so much of my work, not just in this book, um, I'm trying to put Whitehead in lineage with, with Schelling. Um, as uh, process philosophers. And so what, what Schelling does for the new paradigm sciences of his day, uh, sort of in the late 18th, early 19th century, when um, geology was discovering deep time and, uh, you know, chemistry was advancing and electricity and magnetism um, were, were being uh, experimented with and, and theorized about. And, um, you know, the, 
the, the early stages of a kind of evolutionary theory were being worked out um, in biology. And so Schelling was absorbing all of these new paradigm sciences in his day. Well, Whitehead does the same thing in the early 20th century uh, when science goes through another round of major paradigm shifts. And you, I mean, you could even call the early 20th century the second scientific revolution um, in the sense that the old Newtonian mechanistic view was demolished. Um, you know, Whitehead recounts, he was at Cambridge um, studying and then teaching mathematics and uh, mathematical physics. He studied uh, with the, his teacher was the student of um, Clerk Maxwell, um, who developed electromagnetic theory. And so, you know, Whitehead uh, understood mathematics and the application of mathematics to electromagnetism very deeply. And at the end of, you know, in the last couple of decades of the 19th century, you know, Whitehead says that uh, Newtonian physics was considered to be um, almost complete. There were just a few little, uh, you know, mysteries around the edges of this complete knowledge that would, would soon be worked out. Uh, and nobody expected that, you know, with Max, some of Max Planck's ideas in the last few years of the 19th century. And then, of course, 1905, Einstein's miracle year, I think they call it. He publishes these several papers that uh, establish uh, relativity theory, the special theory, and um, the photoelectric effect and all these things. And then a few years later, with the general theory, uh, almost a decade later, um, it was clear that... Uh, physicists had to reimagine the nature of nature, right? And, and Whitehead was uniquely equipped uh, to do this kind of work. Um, he was one of the few physicists uh, at the time who could really understand what Einstein was proposing. Um, and so he's inheriting all of these changes in science, but he's also very aware of uh, the, the damage done to human social life and to uh, the natural environment by a kind of materialistic metaphysics. Uh, he called it scientific materialism, which, you know, he understood as um, rooted in what he called a bifurcation, uh, the bifurcation of nature, as he refers to it uh, in his 1920 book, The Concept of Nature. And bifurcation means uh, that um, scientific materialism has split the world in two, on one side uh, would be, um, you know, the the world as we experience it, with its qualities, um, its its uh, colors, and its uh, sounds, like the melody of a of a robin, um, or the feel of the velvet, is an example Whitehead gives. That's all the stuff that's on one side of this bifurcation, which we would call the subjective or the psychological side. And then the other side would be all the stuff that's measured and quantified uh, by physics, um, maths and, and motion and whatnot. Uh, and Whitehead points out that, you know, we never actually experience any of that stuff. Uh, we conjecture it and, you know, we come up with instruments and mathematical formalisms to describe it, but we never, we never actually experience it. What we experience are the colors and the sounds and the tastes and the feel of the velvet and so on. And Whitehead's whole philosophy, in a way, is is a it begins in pointing out the incoherence of this bifurcated point of view um, that scientific materialism is asking us to believe that the world is nothing at all like what we experience. That our um, all of our subjective experience of feelings and values uh, and aesthetic beauty and so on is purely ephemeral, like the smoke. Uh, or, or the whistle on a train, as T.H. Huxley once put it. Uh, what's really real are, this, uh, are these conjectured uh, systems of, of particles and forces and so on. That again, what it says, we never experience. Um, and so to overcome this bifurcation uh, and to provide a scientifically grounded alternative to materialism, which he thinks early 20th century physics, not only relativity, but quantum theory, uh, itself refutes, right? So in other words, Whitehead begins this attempt to revise Newtonian mechanistic metaphysics by saying science itself has disproven materialism. And the operative metaphor for Whitehead 
rather than the machine, um, becomes the organism. So he says his philosophy is a philosophy of organism. He also calls it organic realism. And as Schelling did in, in his own day, Whitehead takes this, this image or this, um, this idea of the organism and applies it to cosmology uh, and applies it to physics and says, for example, that um, you know, the entities studied by physics are just smaller organisms, uh, which you, know, you could see um, self, self-organization as sort of synonymous or, or what's implied by organism. And the hydrogen atom is just as much a self-organizing system or process uh, as, as is a, 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 a bacterium um, or any other um, living organism. And so Whitehead's process philosophy is exploring the implications uh, of this organic view of nature. And I think allowing us to not only bring all the special sciences, physics, biology, sociology, psychology, uh, into um, harmony with one another, but he's allowing us to bring our scientific picture of nature into alignment with uh, our sense of human um, values and uh, ethics and aesthetic um, judgments. And, um, you know, he wants us, he wants to be able to describe the universe such that um, we don't need to uh, say that, you know, human freedom and law and political order and all these things are somehow reducible to um, the laws of physics as if, you know, physicists nowadays like Sean Carroll will say, you know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have our values and our morals and whatever as human beings and that we shouldn't act as if we're free and so on. I'm just saying that in reality, that's all bullshit. Uh, Really, it's just the laws of physics playing out. And so let's do the best we can to get along knowing it's all fake. (laughs) I think that's a recipe for disaster. Like you, you can't live with that kind of bifurcated philosophy. And Whitehead's trying to say, as a mathematical physicist, hey, we don't need to do that. We can actually see these, the, the, the human values are uh, consistent with what we know about the natural world. Mm. Yeah, an incredibly important sort of development. And yeah, that, that harsh, hardcore scientific materialist reductionism is still obviously very much alive and well, as you just alluded to. I, I know in philosophy of mind, there's, you know, also ideas like limitivism, which is sort of like, takes off the table this idea that consciousness is really anything that's special or interesting or, or worth investigating really at all. And it's more like a, a delusion than it is a, a real feature of the cosmos. And I think that's a direct outgrowth of this scientific materialist uh, re- reductionism. W- would you agree with me there? Yeah. And, you know, I almost think eliminative materialism is um, more consistent in a way than um, like it's biting the bullet, whereas the bifurcated view like like Sean Carroll's is just sort of um, half-assed, like yeah. not really taking seriously the uh, um, the ontological situation that he's describing. Because like the eliminativist is willing to say, yeah, look, it's all just the laws of physics. We talk about consciousness, but it's just a word. You're not actually conscious. I'm not actually conscious. We're just a bunch of zombies in an illusion um, that think they're conscious. Right. And that sort of philosophy, I think, is what's, or worldview of eliminativism is kind of what's guiding all the hype right now about chat GPT and like the AI has woken up and, um, you know, is, is if not already soon to become conscious in a way indistinguishable from human beings, like that whole fantasy, that whole science fiction narrative that we are mistaking for reality is, is rooted in the eliminativist assumption that it's not so much that AI is becoming conscious. It's that, um, you know, if, if, if one argues that AI is conscious, then what, what you know, I would want to believe um, consciousness would be in human beings is, um, is not actually worth anything. I mean, it's, if, if it, it's, it's actually mistaking intellect um, or this sort of disembodied rationality that, you know, Kant was trying to root all of our knowledge uh, of nature within. It's mistaking that kind of... Um, disembodied intellect for consciousness and i have no doubt that ai is very intelligent but it's definitely not conscious and never would be at least if it remains um you know computer circuitry what might happen when we begin to integrate 
these circuits into human brains, I mean, who knows? Um, we could be dealing with a kind of speciation event, actually, but that's a whole other topic. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, illuminativism in so many ways is like the default worldview among uh, educated and especially highly educated people in the West. Um, it, you, you, you begin to imagine the universe such that consciousness can't really exist within it, right? And, yeah. Or you reduce consciousness to this mere intellectual capacity, um, which is why we think or some people think AI is conscious. So, right. yeah, I think I wanted to drop that in there. Very, very interesting, the AI discussion. And in a lot of ways, this scientific materialism and often the reductionism that it, that it comes with is sort of, it grew up under industrial and post-industrial capitalism, and it seems that its premises and its basic assumptions about who we are and, and you know our place in the cosmos is underwriting this increasingly dystopic, techno-dystopic, mm-hmm. Um, future that is that is sort of emerging um, over the horizon <laughs> that it seems that we're we're headed towards. I mean, these ideas of transhumanism, you know, and what you're saying about AI, like you can see where this is going, and I think that also entails the need, the necessity of finding deeper and you know go through scientific materialism as you're you know as you're talking about and trying to transcend it and and get to a a place beyond it and this organic process philosophy organic relational philosophy in general in the marxist terminology we would call it something like dialectics you know this way of apprehending the world um to you know all these different thinkers coming together and, and creating this new way of understanding the world can kind of perhaps transcend the uh, scientific materialism and reduction that is present and then open up, um, you know, new possibilities for the direction of humanity going forward or more precisely is a parallel process as we wrestle with the implications and the way this these ideas actually cash out and we rebel against it. We also are developing at the same time new ways of envisioning ourselves and the universe that is more in line with sort of what comes next as opposed to tripling down on what currently is and, and, you know, driving off the cliff um, with that as our engine. Does that make sense? Is is that aligned with what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Couldn't have said it better. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, another – well, actually, let me ask you this question really quick as a a sort of aside. Where is Whitehead's place in philosophy right now? Like in academic philosophy departments and, you know, people that do history of philosophy, um, Whitehead doesn't seem to figure overly overly prominently – um, in this in this realm, what what is his sort of status in in philosophy? You know, mainstream philosophy, as far as you can tell. Well, it's it's getting better, um, but he was ignored for a long time. Um, perhaps I mean there are different reasons for that, but um, you know he's he was entering into um, metaphysics and uh, philosophical cosmology in the mid nineteen twenties. Um, just at the time that philosophy, both analytic and continental philosophy, were uh, rejecting metaphysics, right? So in analytic, you have Wittgenstein saying um, that philosophers should just focus on um, clarifying language and that ultimately truth could only ever be, um, you know, these sort of sentential sent- sentences indicating um, states of affairs in in the world as revealed to us by the senses. And... Um, in continental philosophy, you have Heidegger, and who, in a very different way, is also rejecting metaphysics and saying we really shouldn't be engaged in that that sort of project. And so, Whitehead's major philosophical works just kind of um, fell on deaf ears, and they they were articulated in the wrong season, uh, as it were. And it's taken a while. Um, luckily, they've been these books have been kept in print, kind of in cold storage, as it were for decades by theologians who um, developed process theology based on Whitehead's ideas about a um, kind of imminent worldly divinity that is nonetheless not reducible to the already existing world in the way that Spinoza had it, right? And I got into that earlier, that there's new possibilities and and potencies for theologizing in a modern and postmodern context um, that in a way, I think, gave Protestant theologians in particular, American Protestant theologians, um, initially at the University of Chicago, um, especially Charles Hartshorn, and then later um, John Cobb Jr. and David Ray Griffin, 
uh, developed this this process theological response in many ways to some of Nietzsche's you know concerns about the death of God and so on and um, the amendments Whitehead makes to classical theology just yeah they proved really fertile and um, the Center for Process Studies at the Claremont School of Theology uh, for the last fifty years um, has been um, keeping. Whitehead's work uh, alive in its application to religion and theology. But I think over the last decade or decade and a half, um, there's just been a real resurgence of interest in Whitehead from across um, different disciplines um, in philosophy, but I think also uh, people in like environmental ethics and and thinking about <clears throat> thinking about the ecological crisis. Um, have, have been very interested in, and in the natural sciences as well, more and more physicists and biologists are recognizing um, that Whitehead was quite ahead of his time and uh, an early sort of, um, you know, he had some early um, gestures towards what's what's nowadays called complex systems science and and uh, uh, so on. And uh, so, you know, for all, for all these in all these ways, I think Whitehead is um, potentially um, going to be, uh, as Bruno Latour suggested, uh, the philosopher of the 21st century, um, in the way that people might say Heidegger or Wittgenstein was the philosopher of the 20th. Wow. Yeah, I, I love that. That's that's really awesome. And I know you're doing your part as well to uh, to push things in that direction, which I, which I applaud. Um, another philosopher, a couple actually, uh, that you mention in the book that, that play a role is, is Deleuze, and you just mentioned Nietzsche. We have an episode actually coming out on Nietzsche fairly soon. Do you want to talk about um, both or one of those figures and sort of how they figure into to this text? Yeah, so I think as I put it in the book, I kind of wanted to test both Whitehead and Schelling's ideas and the fires of postmodernism and uh, the sort of skepticism of metaphysics, uh, at least Nietzsche skepticism of um, sort of a platonic metaphysics. Deleuze obviously is a metaphysician who's, um, uh, I mean, he says he's inverting Plato, which in some ways is exactly what Whitehead is doing. But, you know, I, I thought that um, to really show the relevance of Whitehead's and Schelling's approaches, it would be important to respond uh, to Nietzsche's uh, resistance to um, what the idea of ideas, like his resistance to Platonism um, and his resistance to the idea that there might be some, you know, divine, divine ground or divine ingredient. Um, I guess, you know, Nietzsche, what, what I end up finding out in this close uh, comparison of Nietzsche uh, and Deleuze with, with Whitehead and Schelling is that there's already kind of divinity um, in Nietzsche's work, Dionysus maybe is the divinity uh, most important to Nietzsche. But um, in so many ways, how the ways that Whitehead amends traditional theism and theology brings it very close to this Nietzschean Dionysian uh, understanding of the, of the universe. Um, and you know, Nietzsche also had lots of critiques of of Kant and German idealism generally. Um, and I felt that uh, it was kind of unfair, given that so many of the things um, that Schelling articulates um, are precursors to, to Nietzsche's own ideas. Um, and Deleuze, in terms of bringing Whitehead and Schelling into conversation with Deleuze, it's way easier because Deleuze already did that. Um, right. You know, the influence of Schelling and Whitehead is is all over so many of his books, Um but yeah, the, the idea here is to show that um, in thinking with Whitehead and Schelling, I'm not kind of regressing, certainly not to a pre-Kantian mode of thought, um, but I'm also not trying to regress to a pre-Nietzschean uh, mode of thought. I'm trying to go through Nietzsche's encounter with nihilism, right? And uh, as you put it earlier, come out the other side. And um, hopefully I've done that. I, I think there are certain amendments I make to Whitehead's um, speculative scheme in light of Nietzsche's uh, criticisms of a kind of timeless divine order. Um, and so I'm not just trying to um, Whiteheadianize Nietzsche, as it were. I think uh, things also move in the other direction on certain questions. Mm. The only way out is through. And yeah, you're, you're literally talking about that and then doing it. I like that a lot. 
Um, so we're, we're coming up on our, our time limit here. So I just have a couple more questions for you. One is, is, uh, around the ether, how you make use of it. Of course, the subtitle is etheric imagination. So can you kind of talk about ether theory, imaginal ether and sort of the role it plays in crossing the threshold, particularly I, I found interesting in reimagining nature, as you put it as a plant. I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. Yeah. So the ether and the etheric imagination, uh, plays a large role um kind of hinted at it earlier it's a way of understanding like the 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 um, subterranean depths of our conscious egoic experience right that and that there are methods for um, diving below that threshold which Kant took to be um uh, kind of uh impossible to to pierce and I'm not suggesting that we can pierce it so much as asking us to um reframe our situation such that um that the mind shouldn't have been imagined as as separated from the world by this veil of appearance to begin with uh, and and you know just to, to touch back with um Nietzsche for a second when he goes through his uh, how the true world became a fable um sequence of the history of philosophy if people are familiar with that um google it you'll find it it's where he ends up is you know he's saying there's not an ideal world out there of platonic forms independent uh, of appearances um, once we get rid of that uh, ideal world though we're not then stuck in a world of appearance the the, the nature of appearance becomes uh, transfigured um, and so uh, appearance becomes a portal into the into the real in some sense is what I think Nietzsche would be suggesting and I call this an aesthetic ontology right appearance as a portal back into the real is an aesthetic ontology in the sense that um, usually ontology uh, is is always presupposing a division between appearance and reality and ontology is trying to get behind or beyond the appearance to the real but an aesthetic ontology is saying no the real is the appearance reality is itself this um, this infinite series of appearances and um what the etheric uh, dimension of of nature is an attempt to, to point towards is um, this aesthetic aspect uh, of of reality that um, it's not just matter in motion uh, that if you really want to offer a concrete description of of what nature is what reality is it's a it's a field of of feelings uh, and and pulses of emotion, vector vector feelings, as, as Whitehead says, as I said earlier. And so th the reason I chose the ether to refer to this is because both Schelling and Whitehead, as well as Kant, actually, and some of his late uh, posthumously published work, uh, they all developed an ether theory, not as a kind of scientific hypothesis that one might uh, experimentally prove or disprove, um, but rather as a, a metaphysical um condition that would make our knowledge of nature possible right by providing this bridge uh between mind and nature right and so um the if the ether as a bridge between mind and nature can be analogized to the plant realm in the sense that plant life is kind of between the mineral and animal um uh, dimensions of of nature right it's plants are clearly alive but they're not quite as um mobile as as animals and they don't seem to have as um as rich a sort of emotional and and imagistic and sensory life but they're clearly capable of sensing and feeling and they do move especially when you look at time lapse photography you see that at a different time scale they move quite a bit um but they're also plants are closer to the mineral and you begin to see how um you know there are aspects of order already in the inorganic mineral world um that are you know like crystals and um the ways that chemistry can become self-organizing and so you know by analogizing analogizing the ether to the plant realm uh, i'm trying to indicate that it's kind of this this me it plays this mediating role uh between mind and matter um, and it's it's the the in between um, tension, as it were, uh, that 
is a that can become for us a, a kind of organ of perception. Like I think we can cultivate um, a, a, a form of um, of perception that would be um, capable of hanging out in this tension um, rather than snapping to one side or the other. We can hang out in this tension um, and really cultivate this organ of etheric imagination as as um, as a new methodology in, in, in metaphysics. Yeah. I find, I find that idea exhilarating. I think a, a lot of what you're doing, of course, following in the footsteps of someone like Whitehead and correct me if I'm wrong, but is tearing down these fences between these various dualities that we take for granted, whether it's between subject and object, mind and matter or whatever else. And where those fences were building bridges, building ways of connecting and synthesizing what we took to be, a binary, two opposite things, and actually showing how they bleed into one another and Im- implicate one another. Is, is that a fair way of, of sort of framing it? Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. So I know you touched on this a little bit earlier, and of course we've been touching on it throughout this conversation, but maybe as a great way to sort of come to the end of this conversation and summarize it, what vision of the cosmos and our place in it emerges from this work, in your opinion? And and how do, and I guess how might it impact different fields like philosophy, cosmology, anthropology, etc.? Yeah, well, I think the best way to encapsulate that would be to say it's a participatory vision. Um, and, you know, the idea of participation has... Um, you know, uh, connotations both in, in human social life, um, and, and in, in terms of political participation and cultural participation. Uh, but I think there's also this, um, cosmological aspect to the form of, you know, participation that, uh, this, um, approach to philosophy affords. It's, it's to recognize that, um, you know, human beings are like leaves on a tree, uh, as Alan Watts uh, would put it. It's and you know, uh, or to extend the metaphor, Alan Watts would often say that um, you know the the earth peoples like an apple tree apples. You know, and so we are expressions of the cosmos. We're not um, aliens imported from elsewhere. Um, we weren't parachuted onto this planet from somewhere else. We are uh, natural expressions of it. And it's, uh, we can participate um, if we're able to, to, you know, reconnect with the, uh, the depths of our own being. Uh, we can participate in, um, you know, creating a more flourishing planet, not only for, um ourselves, but for the rest of the community of life on this planet. And I think in so many ways, um, this participatory vision allows us to see how many of our social ills, uh, social inequalities um, are uh, connected to the ecological crisis um, in the sense that uh, our alienation from nature is is not, um, at the end of the day, different from our alienation from one another. And you, you were speaking to this earlier, I thought, in a really uh, clear and compelling way. Um, and so, you know, developing um, this new approach to cosmology is just really an invitation uh, to, to get us to participate um, in, in the world and participate in the construction of a better society. Yeah, beautiful. I, I really do see it as the sort of next step in our growing up as a species. Like I kind of envision ourselves now as, as this, this like adolescent stage of, a, of, a, of an intelligent species where we're still childish in so many ways. Uh, we still have so much growing up to do. I mean, teenagers in this adolescent phase, they often will destroy their futures through short sightedness and, you know, doing risky things and et cetera. And we're kind of in that phase, but there's this promise of being able to grow out beyond it, to develop as a species in a, in the direction that will allow us to become what we want to be, to fulfill our potential as a species, um, not eliminate ourselves through the creation of, of AI or eliminate ourselves through our own short-sightedness, things like nuclear war or whatever, if we can get past those threats um, and, and we can embrace a philosophy and a way of envisioning ourselves in relation to everything and everyone else in the way that you're promoting, 
I, I really do think it represents sort of the next big evolutionary jump of our species and would be a, equivalent of us coming out of our adolescence into mature adulthood and open up the possibilities of what could come next for our species. Um, and so I, I really enjoy it and I think it's really important work. And I deeply appreciate everything you do, Matt. And thank you so much for coming on the show as well. Before I let you go, though, any last words you want to say and also where people can find you and your work online? Yeah, thanks so much, Brett. It's really, it's been a lovely conversation. And, um, you know, the last thing I'd say is just to emphasize what you were just sharing. Um, I think of this phrase, growing down, uh, rather than growing up, as we would think of what it means to become an adult, uh, to, to mature out of this adolescent phase, we need to grow down. Um, I'm not sure if it was James Hillman or a, another uh, psychologist. Uh, lots of people talk about this idea nowadays, but it's part of what I mean by descendental philosophy, right? Let, let's get rooted on this planet. Stop trying to, escape, you know, get. let's stop being fixated on the idea of escaping this planet. It's, yes. it's really um, not going to happen. <laughs> Um, it's just way too hard to live on Mars. I don't know if you've actually, Elon's actually thought it through, but <laughs> we've got to, we've got to save this planet and, um, grow down and just, you know, accept humbly our, our place, uh, as, as, uh, as human beings on the planet earth. And, um, I know, I know your, uh, your podcast and all the ideas that you're trying to amplify here are all contributing to that. So it's really, really great to join the chorus. Mm. Thank you, my friend. I, I deeply appreciate that. All right. Where, where can listeners find you and your work online? Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> best place would be my my blog. Uh, it's footnotes to Plato.com, number two. And um, yeah, they can find the book uh, at various booksellers. Um, not just not just Amazon, if you want to. It is available elsewhere on uh, the publisher's website. Revelor uh, is the publisher. Um, so, yeah. Okay, cool. And I will link to all of that in the show notes. Keep up the great work, my friend, and you always have a home here at RevLeft. I look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks so much, Brett. I look forward to it.